In 2015, a woman named Brooke Whipple was taken and dropped off in a remote wilderness in northern Mongolia for the TV show uh, called Alone. This is a picture of her. Uh, If you don't know the TV show Alone, wilderness experts go on and they compete to be the last person standing in the wilderness. And whoever's the last person standing wins a million dollars. And so Brooke entered the contest. She is a beast. Like she is, she's lived off the land for over a decade. She teaches classes on this. She has all the skills, all the knowledge, all the know-how of living in this remote area with these, there's venomous snakes there. There's voracious beasts that would love to just eat her up for a meal. But she is confident going into this competition that she can win. She's got all the skills. And when the the team goes and they drop her off in this remote area, there's no civilization for miles. There's no person for miles. She is utterly alone out there. It's her versus the wilderness. And as the team kind of leaves, the team that drops her off leaves, you can see the weight of like, oh my word, I'm really alone out here, begins to settle in. And she begins to try to provide for her basic needs, right? She needs a shelter, she needs food, she needs a clean source of water, she needs heat. And so she quickly begins gathering rocks and tree branches and she brought a green tarp to kind of build this shelter. And she built a shelter, it's it's rainproof and she's trucking along. The first couple of weeks, she builds that shelter, she gets a fire going and then she has to find a clean source of water. And so she finds some water, she begins foraging, getting some food coming in, and then eventually she hunts and she gets some meat coming into her diet as well. So she, she's set. About three weeks in, she's got her shelter, she's got plenty of fuel for her fire, she's got clean source of water, she's got all the food she could ever need. But day 27 hits. Day 27, it's torrential downpour where she's at in that area and her little five by five piece of nowhere. And she's stuck inside her, her green tent that she's now calling the green monster. And she begins to film herself with one of the cameras that the team left with her and, and discussing, you know, I have, I have a shelter that's keeping me dry. I have the food I need. I have the water I need. But there's one need that cannot be provided for. I am utterly alone. And she begins to discuss to the camera as though it was another person, some semblance of humanity. She begins to to discuss uh, and record herself as she unpacks how this loneliness is is impacting her mental health. She's saying that this this darkness is just kind of overshadowing her. And and she said, one of the statements that I, I think just revealed her heart so great, she said, I just want someone to share this experience with. And she continued to film herself as she radioed the evacuation team on day 27 and they came and got her out. And when they came up in their Land Rover, she began to speak to them through tears. This is the first sign of humanity she's seen in 27 days. She tells them about the darkness of being alone and how ultimately it wasn't the wilderness that was her greatest enemy. It was the loneliness Today, we're going to begin a series called Better Together, where we're looking at community, building relationships, having authentic relationships in our sphere of influence. When we talk about community, here's what we mean throughout this series, being fully known by others and fully knowing others, being fully known and fully knowing others. And so, you see, though you may not be dropped off in the middle of nowhere, though you may be in the middle of a packed church service or a packed life group or a full household, you can still feel very much what Brooke felt in that moment. I just want someone to share my experiences. I want my heart to be known. I want to know others, their struggles, their joys, their sorrows, their triumphs, their pains. We're created to be fully known and to fully know others. And so today we're going to begin this series and kind of dive into what is the foundation of community, right? Community doesn't happen on accident. If we're going to build community, it's going to have to be on purpose. And so we're hoping to create a vision for us throughout this series that we would be a community on purpose and with a purpose. And we find the foundation of community 
and the essence of who God is. Now, God is this transcendent being who reveals himself in Scripture as one God, and yet within this one God, there's a plurality of persons. If that doesn't blow your mind, you need a brain scan. Like that's, it's just crazy, but it's truth. It's how God has revealed himself to us. And so we're going to kind of dive into that. We're going to come at this with some humility. I'm going to be honest, this is way above my pay grade. And so give me some grace as I try to unpack that we have a, a 4D God and we're 2D beings, right? We have a 4D God and we have two, we're 2D beings. So there's some categories and maybe some verbal vehicles that we can use to begin to understand how God has revealed himself. But the reality is, we can't fully comprehend it because God is transcendent above us. He's other. He's different from us. And yet he's revealed himself. And so we're going to kind of wade into this wonder today, the reality that God is a community. God is a community. And this is a, a, a concept that's kind of all throughout the Bible. There's not like one passage that just like really nails this out. It's a, it's a concept that is progressively revealed throughout Scripture. So I'm going to be honest with you, just straightforward. We're going to be all over Scripture today, all right? Because this idea is all over Scripture today. And so it may feel like we're drinking from a fire hose, but my hope for us at the end of our time together is that you feel in awe and wonderment. We're going to wade into the wonder of God today, wade into the mystery. But I also hope that we feel challenged that as we see who God is and how he's made us, that we feel challenged to go out and live in authentic community in a greater way. And throughout this series, we'll unpack some tools on how to actually do that. All right, so we're going to be in Genesis 1. Uh, Genesis 1, starting in verse 26. This is the, the creation account. God's partway through creating the world, and he is going to create humanity. It says, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air uh, and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. I love this, this portion of scripture because right from the beginning of scripture, we're going straight into mystery. <laughs> like, look at this. Look how God talks about himself. He says, let us now, God's not delusional. He's not hallucinating. He doesn't have a disorder. God is revealing something about himself. Remember, people aren't there yet. It's just, it's God. And he says, let us. From the very first pages, we're thrown into wonder about who this mysterious God is. And, and you know, he could have given us an explanation. He says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, there's this plurality he's speaking to, and he doesn't go, hey, let us, hey guys, I know, like parenthesis, I know this sounds really weird, but don't worry, once Jesus is on the scene, he'll clarify some of this stuff, and the Holy Spirit will come, and we'll get it all ironed out by the New Testament. He doesn't do that. He just allows us to sit in the wonder of the majesty and mystery of who he is. And so he says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. There is a plurality in the Godhead, in, in the one God. We see this again in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6 is a passage where the people of Israel are being challenged. Keep telling your children, pass this on to future generations about what God has done for his people. Keep these stories going. Remember to pass this on. In Deut Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, here's what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now, you may read that first verse there and say, wait a minute, Jason, you were just trying to say and convince me that there's plurality in the Godhead, there's pro that God is three in one, but this clearly says God is one. But if we take a peek behind the linguistic curtain here, I think we're going to see something really cool. So it says, hear, O Israel, this is to the, the God's people, and it says, the Lord now, the word there in the original language, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar or a Greek scholar or Aramaic scholar, but I looked this up. The word there uh, behind the Lord is Yehovah or Jehovah or Yahweh. This is God's covenantal name. Anytime this name was used, people knew who you're talking about. This is the one true God, the God of Israel. So we all know who we're talking about here. This is a true God, our God, the Lord is one. So the next thing that's interesting behind this curtain is God, the word for God in the original language is Elohim. 
This is the, the word Elohim, and you can look this up uh, on blueletterbible.org. This is a great website if you ever just kind of want to check out some of the background behind some of your texts. But Elohim, it means a plurality of God. What? <laughs> a plurality. So he says right here in one verse, the Lord is one, and yet within his oneness, there's this plurality, right? Like mind equals blown. And as we move into the New Testament, we have a little bit more dimension and definition to who this, this God, it's three or a plurality in one, as he reveals himself in what we kind of call a verbal vehicle that we use to understand this is the Trinity. And the first person in the Trinity is the Father. Now, this is, this is one that kind of everybody pretty much gets right. Like even the cults agree that God the Father is God, right? This is not a hard one. It's all over the Bible. I chose one verse because we went over it a few weeks ago, and uh, I think it really shows a distinction here that I think is important. So Ephesians 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So he's saying, God the Father is God, period. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says there's a distinction between the two. They're not the same person. It is not as though God the Father came down as God the Son, lived life, died for us, rose again, and came back as God the Spirit. That's not what happened. That's called modalism, and that's heresy. He says there's a difference. They're different people, and yet they're both God, and there's one God right? Are we lost or what? Like this is awesome mystery we're wading into. God the Father is God. The second person in the Trinity is the Son, Jesus Christ. Now this one's a little more controversial, right? Some people say, well, Jesus was just an enlightened man, or he was a liar or a lunatic, or I mean, uh, he's, he's a good philosopher or a good teacher or a higher moral ethic we should live to. Some people even say Jesus is a God, And this is very important because scripture doesn't reveal Jesus as a philosopher or a God or just a good teacher or a moral higher ethic. Scripture reveals Jesus and Jesus declares about his own self that he is God. John 1 kind of knocks this out of the park as far as who is Jesus. Let's look at it there. John 1, starting in verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, the Word here uh, in the Greek was like the epitome of knowledge. It's logos, the epitome of knowledge. And, And it says, in the beginning was the Word. And you might be thinking we're just like some bubble letters floating around with God the Father. He's going to clarify for us what he means. And the Word was with God. Okay, so they're hanging out together. And the Word was God. So the word was with God and was God. Again, there's a distinction between these two people. He was in the beginning with God. And then all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So now we're getting a pronoun here that says him. This isn't just an impersonal force, or this isn't just bubble letters floating around in eternity past. This is a person we're talking about who is God, who hung out with God in the creation uh, event. And then John, he, he kind of comes back to this concept in verse 14 and really clarifies for us who this word is. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, we know who that is. That's baby Jesus, right? He, that's the Christmas story where God, the eternal son of God, came down, humbled himself and, and, and lived as a human. He added humanity to his deity. This is Jesus. And we've seen his glory, glories of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Again, a distinction here. The father is not the son. The son is not the father, yet they're both God and there's one God. Now the father uh, is kind of in the Trinity. You can kind of think of him as the initiator, especially when it comes to our salvation. John three sixteen says, for God so loved the world that he gave, that he sent his only son, that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. So the father is the sender, the initiator, the giver. And Jesus is the accomplisher, right? Jesus lived the perfect life we can't live. He died on the cross, taking our sin upon himself and taking the wrath of God toward our sin upon himself. And three days later, he rose, triumphing over the enemy, triumphing over sin and the grave. And so Jesus is the accomplisher. 
And we kind of have some categories, some human categories to understand a father-son relationship. Even though God is transcendent above us, he's given us some categories to understand that relationship. So we can understand a God the Father and God the Son. But the third member of the Trinity is often very misunderstood. And it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And I think the Holy Spirit gets a bad rap because a lot of things are attributed to the Holy Spirit that we don't actually see the Spirit doing in Scripture. But the Holy Spirit isn't just the weirdo guy in the Trinity that the Father and Son kind of put up with his crazy antics. The Holy Spirit is the God who comes and indwells us and empowers us and convicts us and enables us to walk according to all that God has for us. And he is God. Now we're going to look at this in Acts 5, but to to give a little bit of background about the story before we get there, Acts 5, there was a couple named Ananias and Sapphira, and they were bad news, right? Like bad guys. And they sold some land, and then they took the money and gave to the apostles, but they kept some back for themselves. They were, they were hiding. And Peter sees right through this charade, and he addresses it. Acts 5, verse 3, it says, Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Now, this is important right here because oftentimes the spirit is thought of, because of the the word spirit, it's thought of as like a ghost or an energy or a channel or some sort of impersonal force. But you can't lie to an impersonal force. He says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. You can't lie to an impersonal force. I can't lie to gravity. I can't hurt gravity's feelings. But you can lie to a person. So Peter is saying, look, you've lied to the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a he. He is a he. He's a person. And he goes on to clarify, he's not just a person. We're going to see Peter use another word for the Spirit just in a minute. He goes on and says, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Peter says, look, yes, you've lied to me, but not just to me. You've lied to God. Earlier, he said he lied to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And so we see in the Trinity, there's there's these three persons, and the Spirit is the one that applies salvation to believers. He's the one that causes us to be born again. He's, He's the one that allows us to be regenerated and have new life, to become a child of God. He's the applier of what Jesus accomplished that the Father initiated. And so the Trinity, we can kind of think of it this way, is the loving community of one God in three persons. Now, this is not do this whole idea justice. There's so much scripture on this idea. And I encourage you to do some study on this, on the Trinity. But I really wanted to hone in. Okay, we've seen that there's a community and a plurality in the Godhead. Where do we get the idea that this plurality is loving? When John 17, Jesus kind of gives us a peek behind the eternal curtain and he opens up what it was like before the creation of the world. You ever wondered like, what was God doing before creation? Look at this in verse 24, John 17. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. What happened before the creation of the world? This God existed in eternal love. The Father is an eternally others-centered being. He's just loving on the Son all day long. And the Son is loving on the Father. And the Holy Spirit is like, you're both awesome. I love you guys. They lived in perfect eternal community forever. The Trinity is the loving community of one God in three persons. And the act of creation was God's desire to envelop us in that loving community. But sin got in the way. And since God is a communal God, that means you and I are communal beings. We are, second point on your outline, we are created for community. We're created for community. Let's go back to the scripture. Genesis 1, 26, again, it says, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. Okay, we're made, we're we're made and imprinted with the image and likeness of God. And he goes on, next verse. So God made 
created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I count four times in those two verses that God says, we're made in the image of God. Like we're imprinted with his nature in some aspects. We, we have a mind, emotions, and will. But most importantly, what I want us to hear is because we have a communal God, we are communal beings. It's not as though this community is a need that we, we can neglect, right? I need to eat healthy, but I can neglect that and eat the cheeseburger. Community is so much more than a need. It's a part of our identity. We're created after a communal God, which makes us communal beings. And this part right here is so important to me. He says, Male and female, he created them. There's some weird, uh, ugly theology going around, I, I've heard in, in North America, in the church, not here at Family Church, but in North America, uh, in the church, that says that man's created in the image of God, and woman, she's created in the image of man. That's not true. Men and women are both equally created in the image of God. And and the idea comes from the reality that Eve was taken from Adam's rib and fashioned by God, but they are both created. This verse says male and female. He created them in the image of God. This is very important. And you know what this means for all of us? None of us can escape the need for community, right? Like I'm an introvert. I would love to like just go home and, and play video games until my eyes bleed and not have community. But that's detrimental. It's not just to my needs, but to my soul, to my very identity. I'd be denying a part of who, my, who I am as myself if I didn't have community. So we are created for community. And firstly, we're created for community with God. This is, this is primary. This is the most important. This, if we don't hear anything else today, please listen. You are created for right relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit. You're created to be enveloped in their loving, eternal, joyous community. That's what you're created for. Look at it in John 3, 16 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Think about this. We just learned about this beautiful, amazing, gracious, loving community of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And they're willing to sacrifice one of their members that you and I might be brought in, that you and I might share in that love, that you and I might experience their joyful communion. You're created for this. But we have a problem. Every one of us is born into this world broken, sinful, and lost. You can't inherit Christianity from your parents. You can't inherit it by sitting in a pew or sitting in a chair. It comes through repentance and faith. Right relationship with God comes through repentance and faith. And it's only possible because of the work of Jesus Christ, the accomplisher in the Trinity. Because Jesus came and he lived on this earth, the perfect life that you and I are supposed to live. Like we blow it every day, right? If we're honest, we blow it, whether it's in thought, word, or deed, we blow it. Jesus never did. And then after 30 plus years, he died on a cross, taking our sin, like an innocent man took our condemnation, our sin, our guilty verdict upon himself. And the wrath of God was poured out towards Jesus on the cross. The wrath that you and I deserve, the holy, righteous, just anger that you and I deserve was poured out on Jesus. He died in our place. And then three days later, he rose from the grave, triumphing over sin, triumphing over Satan, and triumphing over death. And it's in that work and that work alone that we can be brought into the community of the Godhead, the community of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit, that loving community that has always been joyously loving each other from eternity past. We can be brought into that. This is the most important question. And if you're not sure where you're at spiritually, As we go through this community series, I hope you join a community, a space that you can wrestle with these things. Family church needs to be a safe place where people can wrestle, not with just uh, the life after uh, beginning to follow Jesus, but before that too. We need to be a space that's safe for people to ask these kinds of questions. And so if you're not in that space yet of following God, of being in right relationship with him, please get in a community. Ask the questions. 
I promise you, it'll be worth it. The next thing I want us to see is that we are created for a community with people. We're created for community with people. Let's look at it in the scripture, Genesis 2. So Genesis 1 is kind of a 30,000 foot view of creation. Genesis 2 kind of zooms in a little bit. We get a little more detail and dimension. This is the Lord God. This is uh, right after God created Adam, and right? And he brings all the animals to Adam, and Adam's looking for someone who's like him. And he's like, rhinoceros, nope, I don't have that big of a nose. Cat, nope, those things look like a fluffy fluffy little demon. Nope. Uh, Platypus, God, what in the world were you thinking? Nope. And he's looking for someone like him, but no one could be found. And so God says this, the Lord God said, verse 18, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. It's the first time in scripture that God says something is not good in his good creation. And so he causes man to go into a deep sleep. He says, not good. And so God's going to do something about this. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. So this is the first surgery and God created fashions Eve and, and Adam's been looking for somebody who's like him this whole time and he's alone. And the amazing thing to me is he is with God. He's with God. And God says, it's not good for him to be alone. There's massive implications of that. We are not called to just wing it with Jesus by ourselves. When we're called into the kingdom of God, when we're called into the family of God, we are called into a community of God as well. He says it's not good for man to be alone. And what does Adam do when he sees Eve? Look at this. He says, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. She's, he's like, finally, somebody who's like me. He was looking, longing, desiring relationship. Community is God's design and desire for his people. So here's the question. Are you in community? Are you in authentic, real, loving, caring community where you're known, even the hard stuff, right? We often put up a wall that says, I'll let you get this far into my life, but you're not getting past because there's some stuff in here. I believe if you saw, you'd reject me. And if we don't allow people in, we won't have real community. So are, are you in real community where you're fully known and you fully know others? There's a, a, a horrendous study that was done several years ago where orphaned children were taken in and they were cared for to, a, to an extent. All of their physical needs were cared for. Um, they, they had all the food that they needed and they were in a sterile environment. But the nurses who attended these babies were not allowed to talk to them and they had to touch them as minimally as possible. Can you imagine the effects of that? Not allowed to touch them, minimal uh, or minimal conversation or touching and, and, and no conversation. Like they, there's no relationship. There's no community. There's no interaction. And these kids are screaming, looking for relationship, looking for someone to love them, looking for someone to, to hold them, to be with them. And the results of the experiment were all of the children died. Community is innate in all of us. They were looking for someone to be in relationship with. And one of their deepest needs was never met. You and I are created for community. And listen, I know this can be scary, right? Maybe you've had community in the past where, where you've, you've put yourself out there and you got hurt or, or you let somebody into something like deep and, and they rejected you or they made fun of you and, and you kind of recoil from the idea of community. I'm not, I'm not putting myself back out there. Look, I'm not saying those hurts aren't real. There's wounds. But when we neglect community, we're neglecting a part of our identity. And it's in those moments of pain in our community. And I can promise they will come. Like we're in community with broken sinners, right? We're going to hurt each other. But it's in those moments of pain and and suffering that we, we come back to the loving, joyous community of the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Spirit. We rest our hearts there. And it's like a balm for our soul. That's the only perfect relationship you and I have. 
our marriage isn't going to be better, our relationship with our kids or our spouse or our, our grandparents or our friends, nothing can compare to that. So when we're hurting these relationships over here, we come to God the Father and we receive love and grace and forgiveness. And once we've experienced it, now we can go and extend it. I know it's risky and it can hurt, but it's worth it. And community is not just about having healthy relationships. I mean, that's important. And and scripture has a lot to say about that. But I think there's a grander purpose. At the beginning of that sermon, I said, the vision we want to cast is that we want to create community on purpose because community doesn't happen on accident. But more than that, we want to create community on purpose with a purpose. And we've got a great purpose. You see, community that we want to create here at Family Church is about people helping people find and follow Jesus. It's about disciples making disciples. Community is about mission. It's about mission. Like look at what Jesus says in Matthew 16. It, they're, they're, he's kind of questioning and, and quizzing his disciples. He's saying, who do you guys say I am? Lots of people have lots of opinions. Who do you say I am? Verse 15, he said to them, but, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Look at this. On this rock, and I believe the rock is the statement that Peter just made, that Jesus is the Son of the living God. He's the Savior. He's going to build his church on that reality. And the gates of hell won't even prevail against it. We're going to be going into enemy territory and snatching captives out and setting them free by the power of the gospel of God. This is the, this is the vision. And Jesus says, I will build my church. You know what that is? That's the community of God. That's you and I. Community is about mission. This is the mission of God. This is Jesus' vision of the unstoppable church. You see, I believe the unstoppable church is the community of God on the mission of God, living out the different talents, gifts, and abilities that God has given us. You've got gifts and talents that I don't have. I've got gifts and talents you don't have. We need each other, right? This missional effort isn't a solo effort. We need to come together to be encouraged, to be equipped, uh, to say, hey, I think your blind spot's over here. Let me help you. I've got a gifting in that area. We need each other that we might advance the gospel forth in Douglas County. Can you imagine what it would look like if we could live this out in our sphere of influence, where we come together, we're equipped, we're encouraged, and then we go out and we scatter to our sphere of influence so in our homes where we live, work, and play and share the gospel. This is the picture of the unstoppable church that Jesus said he's going to build. Don't you want to be a part of that? Let's get into community this fall. I'm going to release to the campuses Jesus loves you and so do I. All right. Thank you guys so much for sticking around and, and being challenged with us to grow into authentic community. And I really have two questions for you today. The first one I want to challenge us to is how is your relational community with God? Right? If he's the source, if he's, if he's the, the model of perfect community, the only perfect relationship we have, we need to be coming to him for that grace, that forgiveness, that love that we can then carry into our spheres of influence. So how's your relational community with God? How's your relationship? Are, are you spending time with him? Are you in his word? Are you in prayer? Or have you maybe some of those habits kind of fallen off? We want to challenge you to evaluate that this week and, and make a plan for this, this coming week. How are you going to make some steps to build better relationship there? And the second thing we want to challenge you to is do you have a space where you are fully known and where you fully know others? Now that can be scary. But this is what we're called to, to allow people in to, and to be allowed into others. So firstly, are you a safe space that other people can come to you and say, hey, I'm wrestling with this? Like, do you see that happening in your life? And if not, why do you think that is? So are, do you have that space though that you can come to and be fully known and fully known others? And I, I would challenge everybody. Um, we are launching life groups at the end of this month, September 18th. I highly, highly, highly encourage you. If you've never been in a community before, this is a great starting place for you. This is a great place to jump in and begin to build those relationships that God has called you to. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for the picture of your love that's displayed in the Trinity. 
And I pray that at Family Church, we'd be a place that reflects that same kind of love to those in our sphere of influence. I pray that this place would be a beacon of hope, that our four campuses, Sutherland, South Umqua, Green, and our online campus would be beacons of hope in a dark world that thirsts for unconditional love and community. God, I pray that you'd empower us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you guys so much for sticking around. Jesus loves you. So do I. Have a great week.